Thank you for joining the task force on American innovation today for this special webinar, Innovation in Crisis, Emerging from a Pandemic to Restore American Competitiveness. The Task Force on American Innovation is a nonpartisan alliance of leading American companies and business associations, research university associations, and scientific societies. We support federally funded scientific research and promote its benefit to America's economy, security, and quality of life. The Task Force is particularly concerned with research and educational funding in the physical sciences and engineering. Today, we will hear from a distinguished panel of Washington leaders. They are John Newfer, President and CEO of the Semiconductor Industry Association, Dr. Dario Gill, Senior Vice President and Director of Research of IBM, Dr. Sylvester Jim Gates, Jr., President of the American Physical Society, Barbara R. Snyder, President of the Association of American Universities, Dr. Sudip Parikh, CEO of the American Association for the Advancement of Science, Matt Hurahan, Director, R&D Budget and Policy Programs at the American Association of the Advancement of Science, and Kathleen Taffy King-Scott, Vice President of Strategic Initiatives at IBM Research and Co-Chair of the Task Force on American Innovation. Thank you again for joining, and we will now turn to Matt Hurahan to begin his presentation. Thank you, Miriam. Uh, good morning, everybody. Nice to be with you uh, here today. Um, so we're gonna be hearing uh, during today's uh, panel discussion um, uh, about the pandemic, uh, the, the pandemic, excuse me, and the need for uh, investment uh, for recovery. Um, but what I wanted to do for a few minutes before the panel is to set, um, set a bit of, uh, of context for that discussion. And specifically, I wanna talk about uh, what I call the recent deceleration in federal R&D and talk about where it leaves us regarding our international um, R&D competitiveness position. Now, when I talk about the, uh, the slowdown uh, in federal R&D, the deceleration, this is what I mean. Uh, so what you're looking at here, this is discretionary spending for the federal funding accounts uh, that fund just about all federal R&D. Uh, adjusted for inflation since uh, since the 2011 fiscal year. Uh, now, as you know, of course, uh, in uh, beginning in the 2012 fiscal year, Congress put in place uh, the spending caps under the Budget Control Act uh, to slow spending down. Um, and suffice to say, they've had their they've had their intended effect. Um, spending in these accounts uh, dropped by uh, over 10 percent uh, in real dollars in just the first couple of years of these caps. Um, uh, it took six years for, uh, for spending to return to its pre-cap levels. Uh, since then, growth has continued, uh, but it, it has been uh, erratic uh, and uneven uh, year to year. So what has this meant for, uh, for actual R&D spending? Uh, so to answer this question, try to quantify it, uh, on our website, uh, um, uh, in an analysis that we posted, we looked at actual uh, R&D spending over this 10 year period. And we compared it against the historical average, the historical baseline. Um, now for the, uh, the 30 year period leading up to the financial crisis, federal R&D grew by about 5.7% per year on average. Um, wasn't always smooth, right? There were uh, some years of more rapid increases, some years of, of, uh, of decreases. Uh, at the agency level, uh, some agencies had a much smoother or steadier rise. Others had periods of ups and downs. But uh, for the most part, um, in the aggregate, federal R&D grew uh, by average, again, 5.7% uh, uh, per year over that 30-year period uh, leading up to the, uh, to the financial crisis. Since the spending caps were in place, uh, beginning again in, uh, in 2012, federal R&D grew by less than 4% per year. And again, that was characterized by an early drop uh, in that period and then very uneven uh, uh, growth after that. Um, so again, less than 4% growth on average year over year over this period. Now that may not sound like much. Um, that's the, the, the R&D slowdown I'm talking about. In the aggregate, what it means is that if we compare actual R&D, including research, development, um, R&D facilities, R&D equipment, uh, and compare actual spending against 
uh, where spending might have been had it simply grown at the historical average. Uh, we find that um, total R&D was, uh, uh, was, was reduced by $240 billion uh, in the aggregate over that, again, that 10 year window. Um, and that, that shortfall of $240 billion estimated um, cuts across all agencies and R&D functions. That includes defense, uh, the life sciences, space, um, energy, agriculture, veterans health, uh, and, and other areas as well. Um, another way to think about this is if R&D at the start of this period had simply grown at its historical average, um, the, the overall federal R&D budget would be about 20% larger today um, than it is. So while we have been um, decelerating our federal R&D investment, what has happened to our position, the US position uh, internationally regarding R&D? Um, I would argue, and I think you know, one takeaway is that uh, we have picked a really tough time uh, over this past decade uh, to decelerate our public investments in R&D. So let me walk you through a handful of, uh, of, uh, of spending metrics here. Um, and I'll start with total R&D uh, by country or region. Uh, so this graph, it, 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 it includes all R&D from public and private sources. Uh, it is constant dollars and it also is adjusted for, uh, for, for purchasing power parity across economies. So it is comparable. Uh, and I think the basic story that you can see here is, is you know, fairly straightforward. Uh, the US has, you know, continues to achieve uh, a measure of R&D growth uh, in real terms, um, but take a look in particular at what, uh, at what China has been doing over the past decade or so. Um, US is number one, China is uh, now ranked second and is rapidly uh, catching up. Um, over this 10 year period, um, uh, over the past 10 years, Chinese R&D has grown on average by, uh, by more than 12% from all sources in real terms. So that's after inflation. Um, that, is, uh, that is far more than what we've, uh, the US has managed to achieve uh, from all sources. Um, uh, and I think that, that graph uh, shows, it, shows this quite plainly. Okay, so another metric we can look at beyond total um, R&D expenditures uh, is national R&D intensity. And that's simply the share of uh, a national economy devoted to, uh, to R&D. Um, and I think this is a, a, a useful metric to understand and compare uh, the relative innovative capacity of, uh, of different economies. Um, one way to think about this is that the most R&D intensive sectors in a given economy often are the ones that have uh, the, the, the highest productivity, uh, contribute the most to growth, offer uh, the highest wages. Um, so that's that's one way to think about it. Uh, and on this metric, um, uh, again, uh, you know, we have been slipping um, for the U.S. has for quite a while. Um, over the past 15 years or so, we have been surpassed in uh, relative R&D intensity from all sources, again, public and private, uh, by uh, by Korea, by Taiwan, by Germany. Uh, and a handful of others uh, that I have not uh, uh, called out uh, on this visual, uh, Denmark, Austria, uh, and so on and so forth. Um, also, you'll note uh, China is, uh, uh, again, similar story as earlier, um, as the previous slide, China is uh, continu continuing to gain on our uh, R&D intensity. They are now above 2% uh, of GDP. Uh, the US remains below 3% of GDP. Um, and I should point out on this metric, uh, in China's forthcoming uh, five-year plan, which is how they, um, they, they set economic targets and investment targets, right? They, uh, through a series of five-year plans. Um, the next uh, five-year plan under consideration now, the details, some of the details have just been released. Uh, and China is planning uh, uh, to target R&D growth of 7% per year over the next five years. That's more than their expected um, economic growth. So the expectation is at least for the next five years, uh, China is going to continue gaining ground uh, in this metric, um, and many others have also um, established aggressive targets. Germany, uh, the UK, and others uh, are planning on uh, uh, investing and adopting policies to increase their relative um, uh, R&D intensity. 
So that last graph, that was all sources, right? Total R&D, public, private. Um, if we zoom in on public R&D in particular, um, I think you can really see the, the effect of our recent R&D, uh, federal R&D slowdown um, and where it's left us uh, regarding our international competitiveness. And it's important to remember as you, um, as you look at this graph that public R&D, um, it serves a special role in the innovation system, right? It is not the same thing um, as industrial R&D. Um, it, um, you know, it, it tends to be uh, much more of a complement to industrial R&D. Um, it, uh, it also serves as an important uh, input for human capital formation, right? Um, so uh, lots of uh, researchers, uh, you know, young researchers, postdocs, grad students rely on, on federal support. Um, and one of the stories in, uh, that emerges in the literature is that uh, public R&D and R&D partnerships tends to result in more novel inventions, more innovative uh, inventions um, of higher quality, higher quality patents. Um, so again, it, it serves a, a particular function in the innovation system. And when, uh, when public R&D intensity drops the way you're seeing it here, um, that does have uh, long-term ramifications for our, uh, our domestic innovative capacity. Uh, on this metric, uh, and again, you can see the, the quite clear decline since, uh, since the financial crisis and the uh, implementation of the spending caps, um, we have now dropped to 14th uh, in the world in public R&D intensity. We're 10th in total R&D intensity, um, 14th in public R&D intensity. And again, plenty of economies, a lot of the, 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 the similar, same names are, are showing up here, Korea, Germany, uh, et cetera, have, uh, have moved ahead of us on this, uh, on this metric. Uh, so a couple more. Now, R&D, of course, is just one input to innovation. Um, it's great if you have the dollars, but you also need a talented workforce to make use of them, right? To actually conduct the research, produce uh, the innovation uh, that, you're, that you're looking for. Uh, and again, on this metric, uh, if we look at researchers uh, per capita, researchers per thousand of the labor force, um, again, we have been, been slipping. It's been a, a much steadier, longer term uh, decline, again, very much a function of other countries moving ahead of us, uh, making uh, pointed, um, intentional uh, uh, policy decisions to invest their, increase their, their innovative capacity uh, and increasing their skilled workforce. Um, we are now uh, 18th in the world when it comes to researchers per thousand, uh, again, being surpassed by many familiar names. Um, I'll also draw your attention at the bottom to China. Um, they have a, an incredibly large labor force uh, and so the uh, you know, relative researcher intensity of their labor forces remains quite low, but it's also worth pointing out that in terms of the total aggregate number of researchers, they are actually number one in the world. Uh, they surpassed the US by um, uh, uh, several years ago um, and, um, uh, and, and, and remain in the lead. Um, so that's something to keep in mind. Don't let the, the low researcher intensity of their labor force uh, fool you. Uh, and the last metric um, I will point to um, is, and I think this one's uh, an important one, uh, that is the total number of triadic patent families produced by uh, an economy in a given year. Uh, what is a triadic patent, you ask? Well, a triadic patent, simply put, is a patent for the same invention that's been filed in multiple international patent offices, so the U.S., uh, the EU, and Japan. And I think this is a useful um, metric of innovative output because um, the, it, triadic patents tend to offer a better indicator of quality and of value. Um, you know, there are lots of patents out there. Many of them aren't worth that much. Uh, but if you are an inventor, um, if you're gonna take the, the time and effort to uh, file a patent in multiple international patent offices, odds are pretty good that that patent is gonna be you know, worth it. It's gonna offer uh, a bit more potential value. Uh, and so this is a pretty good indicator of, of quality innovative output. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think the, the, the story here is fairly plain. The U.S. remains among the leaders. Japan is number one. Uh, but again, take a look at China over the past decade. They have seen a, a, about a 500% increase in the, uh, the number of triadic patent families they are producing. Um, that's, that's pretty remarkable. Um, pretty rapid growth. And I think it's a good indicator of the fact that not only are they, excuse me, not only are they investing 
uh, the dollars uh, and uh, and you know training the, the workforce, but they are making use of it and actually producing uh, real innovation. Um, and again, there's little indication that that, that trend is going to continue uh, in the uh, in the near term. So so let me uh, wrap up here by looking ahead uh, very briefly. Um, so of course the question is, what do we do next? Where do we head? Um, well, one option, of course, would be uh, making the choice to uh, invest to offset um, that, that federal slowdown, the, uh, the shortfall in, in federal R&D, get us back on that historical baseline. Um, to do this, and this is you know, uh, one illustrative example, let's say we want to do this in five years and get us back to that historical baseline. Uh, that would take annual growth of 9.6% in, uh, in federal R&D over the next five years. And that would get us back on track from that historical baseline. Um, I would note that, this, that, that we have achieved that growth rate before. There've been uh, multiple occasions in the past um, when, uh, when federal R&D has seen that kind of growth. Uh, and I'd also again point out that, um, as I mentioned earlier, uh, the Chinese strategy right now uh, is to achieve 7% growth over the next five years. Um, so you know, we'd be looking to beat, uh, under this strategy, we'd be looking to beat uh, beat the Chinese pace of investment uh, somewhat. Um, so let me wrap it up there. Um, uh, please check out our website, triplas.org slash RD uh, with uh, some additional details on the analysis I, I talked about and, uh, and other data as well. Uh, and at this point, let me go ahead and turn it over uh, to, uh, to Dr. Parikh uh, for our, uh, our, uh, our panel discussion. Uh, the floor is yours, sir. Thank you, Matt. Uh, thank you, and uh, good morning, everybody. Uh, you know, as the as the CEO of AAAS, I have the privilege of representing over 120,000 scientists and engineers from every scientific discipline, and they are working tirelessly to advance science and serve society for the benefit of all. And here's what they tell me: uh, It seems strange to say it during a pandemic, but we are living in wondrous times. Uh, the pace of discovery and innovation has never been faster. You know, we've seen. We've seen the methane covered mountains of Pluto and we've experienced exhilarating Mars landings in HD, but we've also detailed extensive changes to our climate and environment. We've advanced quantum computing and artificial intelligence to the brink of broader utility. Uh, we've harnessed gene editing to potentially, potentially cure diseases like sickle cell anemia. We never used to say cure. Uh, we've also uh, seen the advancement of industries that require deep research and development and advanced manufacturing capabilities. And despite failures in our public health response to the pandemic, the biomedical research enterprise has never worked more quickly to understand and address COVID-19. Now, the US pandemic recovery is, uh, is underway, uh, we hope, and it's a prime example of how our country depends on world-class research to advance fundamental science, uh, and then use our acquired knowledge to tackle big problems or even existential threats. Uh, scientific discoveries are not the result of a single eureka moment, but years of patient, dedicated, and funded work. And you know, this is true for the rapid development of wholly novel coronavirus vaccines uh, that are based on recent research advances in biomedicine, but it's also true for developing advanced technologies that are gonna drive job growth. It's also true for developing the technologies that are gonna address climate change. But these achievements are lagging indicators of previous investment. And as, as Matt just showed you, our federal tax supported R&D expenditures, which pay for the bulk of this fundamental research are shrinking relative to our competitors around the world. And the cadence of emerging crises and the pace of, of these planet changing discoveries, uh, they're gonna necessitate the integration of science into policymaking through the elevation of scientific advisors uh, and significantly increased investment in science and engineering. But at the same time, you know, we have issues with educating the future STEM workforce. We need to maximize our domestic human capital, our people in STEM by more fully engaging diverse communities with an intentional emphasis on those that have been ignored, marginalized or harmed by scientific advancement. Uh, you know, what I always say is that if we're gonna address the challenges of the future and compete globally, we are going to have to draw upon the talents and uh, skills of the descendants of Native Americans, pilgrims, founding mothers and fathers, enslaved peoples, Ellis Island arrivals, and immigrants from everywhere. We are at a pivotal moment. 
Uh, unfortunately, due to the pandemic and slow erosion of investment in our nation's universities and laboratories and research capacity, um, you know, we are facing eroding capacity to nurture ideas, discoveries, and most importantly, that skilled STEM workforce. And this is happening just as uh, Matt showed us, our global competitors are pouring more investment into R&D, building their own state-of-the-art labs and making it more attractive for their talented students to stay local. Uh, and also attracting some of our best students. Uh, make no mistake, we are in a global competition. Uh, what we do now could determine who benefits from scientific discovery in the form of better jobs and improved health. So the topic of this, of this uh, discussion today with an extraordinary group of individuals is how can we emerge from the pandemic charting a new course, uh, setting a new trajectory for the R&D investments for our country and all the people in our country, because uh, we're going to need this for our prosperity. So that's our topic today. We have an amazing uh, panel. I'm so excited about having this discussion. So I'm going to I'm going to open it up now. I'm I'm going to dispense with uh, uh, with bios because uh, they are uh, they're available to you uh, and uh, go right to the discussion. So um, you know, let's start with let's start with uh, COVID and the importance of basic R and D. Um, we talked about the fact that we're coming out of this pandemic, the nine month vaccine race uh, that just occurred, it wouldn't have been possible without the 20 to 30 years of federal investments in research. Uh, Barbara, as the, as the representative of the nation's uh, uh, foremost research and development universities, uh, would this have been possible without that long-term commitment to, to R&D? Sudip, it's such a great story, the development of the vaccine, and you're absolutely right. It wouldn't have been possible without this long-term investment. It's a great story about the connection between fundamental research and innovation, and then ultimately improving quality of life for people in our country and around the world. The vaccine, of course, the first two vaccines that were approved for emergency use in the United States were built on an mRNA platform, which people have learned means messenger RNA. And that, of course, grew out of decades of basic research Met much of it funded by the federal government at our research universities that, that did research first into how RNA works and then the role of messenger RNA and ultimately the platform that had been around for quite some time before Moderna and Pfizer were able to use that platform to create those first two vaccines. So it's an incredible story of that long-term investment and the tale, the wonderful tale that fundamental research often has I could hold up my cell phone is yet another example of, of many of the pieces and parts in that or in many of the things we all use every day and take for granted that were that grew out of fundamental research, much of it funded by our federal government. It's incredibly exciting and, and, and it is remarkable how there are parallel stories, uh, not just uh, not just the pandemic. And so let me turn to the uh, to the rest of the panel uh, you know, with with the COVID uh, recovery in mind. Uh, what does that tell us about the urgency of investing in science today? I mean, are there are there parallels in other areas? Uh, uh, Daria, maybe maybe go first, and then uh, then I'll turn to others. Yeah. So I was mentioning the, the, that this unique moment that work that that we have right now in the realization, I think, in the American public that the scientific method works, and the example of the vaccine is is very illustrative of it. But when I highlight the point is this compression of time to discovery and the implications that that's going to have to face some of the existential challenges that we confront. So vaccine average development time, right? Historically, 14 years, the fastest that ever been done, four years. What a difference it makes that we had made investments such that we can do that in nine months. So now project forward and you look at other challenges, sustainability and climate change, creative inclusive economic growth, dealing with future uh, you know, pathogens and, and potential pandemics. And what we have an opportunity right now is that we're witnessing a revolution in the world of, for example, information and computing, the role of artificial intelligence, the very role that you mentioned about quantum computing, the role of biotech. So this is the moment for action to double down as a nation, to commit what it takes to be successful so that we create all of the platforms that we're gonna need to compress the time for discovery, for problem solving, for solution, and to drive economic growth. So I, I think we've studied this problem to death is my, my main message. The time right now is a time for asking, uh, action and the fiscal policy instruments that we're now, you know, we're seeing in Congress adopting R&D, 
is an essential fiscal policy instrument to achieve the objectives of the nation. Thanks, Daria. Uh, Jim, maybe I'll turn to you next. Uh, you know, uh, you're, you're, a, you're a physicist. Uh, talk about it from the, the point of view of outside the biological sciences. What, 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 what's the urgency here? So first of all, thank you for this opportunity. And I uh, am very grateful to be able to represent the physical sciences. So uh, the pandemic has presented an excellent opportunity to see how fundamental science in the biosciences has actually become an enabling tool for ending this pa terrible pandemic with its half a million loss of American lives. So, so when people start thinking about physics, they often think, well, gee, that's not part of this story. And it's not part of the direct story, except that the instruments that were often used to understand these behaviors come out of physics. So uh, let me uh, now talk about prospectively, because I've just given you a retrospective view. So let me talk prospectively now. Uh, as we saw in the data that Matt Horahan presented earlier, the US now ranks number 10 in R&D as a percent of the GDP. And for public R&D investments, we rank even lower. We're at 14%. And uh, I had the privilege last year to be part of the group that worked with Norm Augustine and Neil Lane, two very distinguished uh, scientists, policymakers. And a report was released by the American Academy of Arts and Sciences called The Perils of Complacency. And that report really fits very well into what the situation is that we find ourselves in. It has some prescriptions, but uh, let me just talk about the prescriptions. Uh, number one, we want to secure leadership by providing sustainable federal funding and setting long-term investment goals. This is going to be critical. We just heard Dr. Gill as he spoke to this very point. Uh, the second recommendation, uh, indeed, uh, I'm sorry, prescription, is that we have to ensure that the American people receive the maximum benefit from federal investments in research. And that means spread it out among all the American people. And then the third prescription, which is of some importance, is that we want to regain America's standing as an innovation leader, establishing a more robust national government industry re, uh, uh, research partnership because it takes all the parts. We also see that other nations are bolstering up their s and enterprises. Countries are investing in their universities and laboratories and building state-of-the-art facilities. Other countries are also becoming destinations of choice uh, for large facilities. There are 500 meter aperture circle radi radio telescope in China and the European X-E-Ray free electron laser facilities, the world's largest and brightest X-ray laser are just two examples. And just this week, we saw another example of the challenges of this race. Uh, there has been an agreement signed between uh, uh, Russia and the People's Republic of China to build a laboratory either on or in the vicinity of the moon. Uh, since I was born in 1950s, this sure sounds like the beginning of a space race. Uh, where are we going to be in this particular challenges? And then finally, countries are making investments because they see the value of fundamental research. They see the value of keeping their students, their young aspiring scientists in their own country, rather than having them come here to the United States, for example, in order to do research. So now is the time to get ahead of what we see prospectively in the future. So let me end here, uh, Sudup, and thank you. Thanks, Jim. Uh, uh, you bring up some, some really good points and we'll, we'll come back to some of those workforce issues here in, here in a moment. Uh, John, let me turn to you. Um, you're, you're, uh, you lead the, the Semiconductor Industry Association. Tell me about uh, the relationship between, uh, between the industry and this basic research. So thanks, Sidi. I think the, uh, uh, the pandemic has, has put into bold relief how critically important uh, semiconductors are to, uh, to our lives. Um, they, they, they helped us work remotely. Uh, they helped us learn remotely. Um, they, they facilitated e-health. Um, the chips have gone into ventilator machines. With, without innovation, the semiconductor conductor industry, we would not have been able to get through this pandemic in, in, in the way that we have. 
And, and I, I raise that point because our industry could not be nearly as innovative as it is without uh, um, partnerships with the federal government for basic research. So our industry is just wildly, fiercely competitive. Um, and, that, and that's great. Uh, competition creates innovation. But when you're doing very basic innovation, you've got to have a platform where these fierce competitors could come together and, 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 and come up with uh, innovations that can drive to the, next, to the next switch, to the next big innovation. And the federal government has done that. We have a long history in the semiconductor industry with that. Um, we have examples of this a DOE funded DOE funded program in the 1990s helped us jump forward with something called extreme ultraviolet lith lithography. That's a revolutionary, insanely complex technology that helps us build amazingly tiny transistors today. DARPA funded in the 1990s and 2000s um, funding helped us advance a new breakthrough transistor design called. FinFET, the technology that has also allowed our industry to dramatically sh shrink transistor feature size. And in materials, DOD funded uh, funding helped us jump forward with gallium nitride technology, now widely used in radio frequency chips that are in important components in all cell phones. And the list goes on. Um, importantly, as we heard earlier uh, this morning, we're not operating in a vacuum. China and other global competitors are intensifying the development of a domestic semiconductor industry and plowing huge dollars into basic R&D. And semiconductors, as we saw in bowl relief with, with, the, uh, with the pandemic, have become critical to, to everything important to us. They're driving AI innovation, quantum computing, 5G and 6G, uh, Techno, uh, t telecommunications, losing leadership in this critical area um, will risk losing leadership, American leadership in, in, in technology or overall. So we think it's very important that um, federal, federal uh, partnerships continue in our sector and others. Um, there's something called the CHIPS Act for America that just passed in Congress. And there's a, an, another piece of legislation called the Endless Frontiers Act. Uh, both bill, bills propose substantial increase in federal funding for R&D in key areas such as materials, science, physics, computer science, and engineering. We, of course, support these investments. The stakes are very, very high. Failure to ambitious, ambitiously invest in these areas is really, really not an option. Thanks, John. Um, you, you raised uh, several important issues there uh, around competition, uh, global competition around China. Let's, let's come back to those. You know, as, I, as I think through, uh, you, you all uh, hit on the, the theme of, uh, of increased investment and, uh, and being competitive with our, uh, with our, um, in, the, in the global landscape. But in addition to dollars, um, you, need, you need brain power. And I'm, I'm, I'm interested in, in digging into some of the workforce, workforce issues. Um, so in addition to the disruption of research activity that, uh, that we saw in the pandemic, uh, I think we also saw uh, some disruptions to our, our STEM talent pipeline, uh, both domestically and internationally. Uh, Barbara, maybe I'll turn to you first uh, to, to, to walk us through that. Why did the pandemic uh, disrupt some of those pipelines and, and will they immediately pop back? It is not clear whether they will immediately pop back. Time will tell. But among the challenges we have is making sure that we continue to produce the kinds of researchers who are generating the innovation that we've been talking about already this morning. And that requires uh, uh, our ability to be able to continue to attract the best and brightest students. We know that international enrollment in American universities has fallen, and that is a concern because we wanna continue to, as I said, attract the best and brightest. And we worry about early um, career scientists whose work has been impacted negatively as a result of this. So there are lots of challenges out there right now. And I think our competitiveness is on the line. And I hope that we all agree that this is the time to get behind these investments that will help produce the people who help produce the research. Thanks, Barbara. Uh, Jim, uh, you know, coming out of the pandemic, 
what, what are some of the ideas from the, from the physical sciences in terms of what we need to do to build the STEM workforce uh, to, to remain competitive? And, and what's the role of the federal government in that? So, uh, so to, let me address this by starting with uh, the state of uh, our, um, our enterprise. Uh, it turns out that the pandemic uh, has had an impact on the physical sciences that is very dramatic and very disparate. Uh, every year, the APS holds the largest physics conference uh, in the world. It's our March meeting, which will take place next week. And it regularly draws more than 10,000 attendees. And we can use our meeting as a proxy for the health of the physics community. In particular, our research productivity. This year, we've moved to a 100% virtual meeting, uh, accommodating uh, safe social distancing, but we still saw more than 10,000 summaries, abstracts submitted to our meeting. That's the good news. Now I'm gonna give you the downside. But taking a closer look at the abstract submissions reveals some real concerns. Abstract submissions for US re uh, researchers is down 10% this year. We can't draw hard conclusions from this trend since it's only one year, but we can draw some firmer conclusions when we look at the relative effects on the data. Here's what I mean. When we dig a little a bit deeper, we see the submissions from experimental scientists, physicists, decreased by more than 20% from 20 to 21. That's a loss of one in every five experimental papers. And those are the parts of physics that contribute to our, our, power, our power to uh, drive innovation in our nation. Another relative effect that we say uh, that we saw was when we looked at uh, to see if particular segments of our community were disproportionately impacted by the pandemic, we found large drops in the abstract submissions from young, up and coming talent, recent PhDs, postdocs, and early career faculty. And physics is no different from other fields and industries. We are seeing women are being disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. Uh, the significant reduction in US research productivity and the disruption of key parts of our talent pipeline are strongly indicated. And these are clear signals that we need to adjust course if we're going to maintain our global leadership. And so the disruptions are in the data. You know, I, I tell people we physicists are a data-driven operation it's in the data and the lights are flashing red. Thanks, Jim. Yeah, that's uh, uh, incredibly concerning. Uh, if I turn to, if I turn to, uh, to John now and, and just say, uh, you know, how does, has industry, does, does industry feel like there's an adequate pipeline of, of STEM graduates? You know, as, you, uh, as you're trying to do advanced manufacturing, as you're trying to keep up with the demand uh, for, uh, uh, for semiconductor uh, around the world, what, what's, the, what's the story? Oh, you're on mute, John. Yeah, that's uh, uh, thanks, Sadiq, for that. Um, yeah, yeah. The the answer to that question is is, is no. We we do not feel there's a, a, a big enough big big enough pipeline for us. In fact, um, for uh, our, our 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 companies that manufacture semiconductors have a, a big big problem filling um, uh, uh, filling the jobs that they have. Uh, literally thousands of jobs um, go unfilled uh, because of uh, the pipeline is not big enough. So we, we basically have um, uh, what, what, one very interesting fact here, and that is three of four uh, full-time graduates in electrical, engineer, electrical engineering and computer science programs in the U.S. are international students. That's three of four. So that's great. Um, we we want to cultivate the international talent. But, but, but we also want to cultivate the indigenous talent. And um, so we have, we have a, a shortage of indigenous talent. And then for the international students, we do a great job, job of bringing them over to the US and educating them in, in, our, in, our, in our incredibly uh, good universities. But we also do a great job of chasing them away uh, uh, to, to go back and work for uh, our competitors overseas because our immigration system is really so broken that uh, we can't keep the talent talent here. So um, we really need to um, to polish both both sides of this coin. We need to develop more homegrown STEM talent, and we need to be able to um, keep uh, the the foreign talent that we do such a great job of of, of educating. 
That's great, John. A uh, quick follow-up: uh, are those are those jobs all around the country? Are they are they uh, are they in one place? They're, they're all around the country, right? Great question. Uh, Silicon Valley um, actually is, uh, is is where the very little silicon is being. Very few chips are actually produced there anymore. Silicon is now chips or wafers are now produced in 18 states uh, around the country. Uh, states that you wouldn't think do this: Florida, Colorado, Maine. The 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 big centers are of course Oregon and Arizona and Texas and, and New York, but. A lot of chips are made all over the country. Extraordinary. Uh, Daria, turning to you, um, uh, you know, you, you, you mentioned quantum computing just a little while ago. I know that's one of the fields where the, the competition is incredibly, uh, inc incredibly urgent uh, globally. Uh, is, do, you know, following up on, on John's uh, point about one of every four are, are, are coming from, from the US, is it similar in, uh, in, in the advanced computing areas that, that you work in? Yeah, no, that's right. I mean, it's very, it's very similar statistics that uh, that John shared. I mean, and and related to to that, I, I wanted to address the the actions that we could take also in this area, understand yeah, workforce, right. because uh, you know progress in creating a diverse and inclusive science and engineering enterprise has really not kept pace also with the demographic trends um, in you know in our country. And we just need to be much more aggressive about cultivating the fullness of the nation's talent. So let me give some examples. You know, the, the proportion of Black and Hispanic representation in science and engineering rose, I think, from 1995 to 2017, fairly significantly. Um, they remain deeply underrepresented, right, compared to their proportion in the general population. And I'll give an example with women, too, right? Over the past two decades, they've doubled the number of science and engineering uh, occupations held by women, but despite all of that, and despite the fact that that women uh, are over half of the college-educated workforce as of 2017, they account just for 29% of the science and engineering workforce. So one of the uh, absolute imperatives that we must do as a nation is that come 2030, we need to achieve a representation in the STEM workforce that mirrors the diverse population of our nation. And that's connected to the shift that we gotta do on the over-reliance of international talent to the investments that we need to make here domestically to be able to achieve those objectives. And that needs to touch every state and every area of the nation. Gary, I think that's so important. You know, I, I, uh, we saw in Matt's charts that even though the um, workforce intensity in China is lower than most countries, in, in gross numbers, uh, the STEM workforce is the largest in the world. And uh, it's unlikely that we're gonna uh, compete at the level of gross numbers. Uh, we've got to compete on uh, the, the, uh, the creative impact that comes from these diverse teams uh, that, that, that is really our, our biggest strength. I, I, love that, uh, I love that you brought that up. Um, you know, I, I, we've, we've, touched on, um, we've touched on China and other countries several times in this conversation. Let's let's go there full force uh, uh, for a minute. Um, you know, in in every one of the areas we talk about, life sciences, physical sciences, uh, industry, uh, we've talked about the, the challenges uh, that are arising around the globe. Uh, let me uh, start with you, John. Uh, just in terms of China, what is the what is the the thing that you're worried about uh, in semiconductors in particular? Uh, and then what is uh, what is the the policy uh, antidote that we should be thinking about? Yeah, there's there's two things. Uh, one, it's not so pertinent to this to this group, but it's it's that we need to have more uh, uh, domestic manufacturing of semiconductors. Uh, in 1990, 37 um, percent of semiconductors around the world were created right here on U.S. shores. Now it's 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 12 percent. But 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 there's there's more legs to this stool, and 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 we need to also massively. Uh, increase our federal investments in semiconductor research and semiconductor research related areas. Uh, you can have all the fabs in the world, but if you don't have the innovations developed here to, to feed them, you're, you're, you're diminished. So, so, so the, the, the solutions are uh, what, what I mentioned earlier, we need to have federal legislation that, that locks uh, funding in place. Uh, the, the CHIPS Act um, includes not just incentive, incentives for more manufacturing in the U.S., but it also includes very significant um, programs um, 
to uh, give a, a boost to uh, R&D, uh, R&D funded by the federal government in these beautiful partnerships that we've had with the federal government since the beginning of our industry. And we need to, we need to go back to that and double down on that. Other countries have made this a strategic priority. And um, we have got to come back to that and do that as well. Thanks, John. Um, Dario, in, uh, in, in the, the research areas that you lead, um, you know, again, I, I just come back to it. I know that there's an urgency around talent, but, but what else? What, what are the challenges that you, that you see uh, with respect to China and other countries? I, I don't want to just limit it there, but and what do you see as the antidote? Well, what I see is that in general, we've had a very kind of defensive posture and what we need to have is a much more like offense posture. And what we mean by that is to leverage our strengths. And one of the dimensions that we got to bring onto the table is we have a very diverse from the perspective of institutions like our federal government and you know federal research lab or incredible universities and the private sector. And one of the creativities that we got to bring into the table with these new forms of legislation and investments is how we work with one another. And I think that that is a dimension that we see China doing with their own model, and that's not our model, but, but they don't have any sort of conflict in being able to bring you know, their own government investments and uh, you know, whatever what I call private sector investment in that context of uniting forces when appropriate to drive technological leadership. So I think in our model, we need to be able to do that much better. And I'll just give a quick example of, of creativity there. Last year, you know, and, you know, with the advent of the pandemic, we created something called the COVID-19 High Performance Computing Consortium, where we had a simple thesis. Let's aggregate the best supercomputers in the world and make it available to our researchers. And we brought together private sector, right? I mean, it's not just IBM, but Amazon and Google and, you know, and HP and so on. Seven national laboratories of the United States NASA, the National Science Foundation, over a dozen universities, and we've aggregated almost close to $2 billion worth of computing power. And we did this collaborating and cooperating for problem solving. And I just think this is also a moment for institutional innovation. And the, how we bring the sectors together towards our most important priorities is also a central dimension that we have to address right now. And that is the antidote. I mean, that is our strength, but we've got to do it in a new way. Thanks, Dario. And I'll, I'll point folks to the chat where uh, uh, Erica LaFay from Representative Weber's office is, is, uh, is mentioning some pieces of legislation related to this. Uh, Barbara, let me turn to you. Uh, you know, the university uh, uh, system in the United States is, uh, is, is, uh, is one of our crown jewels, uh, as far as I think, I think everyone agrees to that. Um, but, but you do see this, this competition, uh, both for students' talent uh, resources. Uh, what, what, do, what do you see as the, the challenges internationally, particularly with China? And then what do you see as a policy antidote? Well, I think the challenges have been documented. It is a very competitive world and we are competing for talent as well as resources, as you said. And particularly now with the, with the pandemic challenges layered on top of those competitive challenges that already exist. Our research university labs, many of them were shut down for a time. Researchers had to pause their projects. And, and then when they came back, obviously with new protocols in place and new things to try to keep people safe, uh, it's, been a real, it's been a real challenging environment, let's put it that way. But the bottom line is that going forward, we have to think about the best way to ensure the success of our competitive environment. And I agree with Dario that that the collaboration that we do is so important, making sure that all the best minds, all the best minds in the country and the world are sitting around our tables in the United States. And I'm so proud of the way our research universities attract talent, but that does require investment and it, it can't be turned off and turned on um, at the flip of a switch. It, it's a long-term investment in producing the people who, who generate that kind of research. So things, investments in research right now, I think could not be more critical as we face these competitive environments and as we're coming out of the, the challenges around the pandemic and what those meant for our research universities, our faculty, our students and our staff. And that's true also in the private sector and those, those collaborations that we've built between universities and the government and industry. I mean, that is one of the beauties 
of American research, one of our greatest strengths. And I hope we don't lose sight of that. And I want to go back to Matt's earlier uh, charts about the, the need to invest now and what kind of investment it would take to have real growth in the research enterprise. That's essential if we're going to make progress and not continue to lose ground competitively. Thank you, Barbara. Um, Jim, uh, you mentioned a couple of international projects that you thought, my gosh, you know, that's, uh, that's showing the, um, uh, the aspirations of our, uh, of our global competitors. Uh, and Dario spoke of the need to, to be proactive. Uh, you know, uh, and that reminds me of sort of the, what I hear from the National Science Board and from the, uh, the NSF director about, you know, if, if they have a, a talents program, we have to have a million talents program. Uh, Jim, what do, you, what do you see in terms of, um, uh, in, in terms of the, the physical sciences and also uh, you are a, um, uh, you are a incredibly well-traveled uh, a scientist. What, in terms of looking around the world, what do you see as the, the proactivity the United States needs to have? Uh, in the physical sciences. What should we be dreaming about? So thank you again. Uh, let me try to deal with this, uh, uh, this question in a, from a couple of different uh, uh, viewpoints because it's, a, it's something that we have to be smart in approaching in terms of policy and investment for this country. So let me start by looking again a, a little bit retrospectively back at the pandemic. The pandemic has affected international student enrollment, for example. Uh, and uh, the physics PhD programs, a recent uh, so one of our surveys reveal that first year PhD students enrollments nationwide in schools outside of the top schools was down by 17% in 2020 compared to 2019, largely driven by a decline in the number of internationally enrolled students. So why are schools outside the top 20 so important? Well, because they graduate 75% of the PhDs in physics each year. But this is not just about international students. When we talk about building the US STEM, pipe, uh, US STEM workforce, what we need to emerge from this crisis with is in a position of leadership and strength, we need to consider both parts of our STEM talent pipeline. And we need to find ways to bolster our domestic workforce and continue to attract top international talent. And that's what I mean by smart policy, smart investments. Well before the pandemic, our country was failing to capitalize or actively neutralizing some of our key competitive advantages, including our diversity. The percentage of women and people of underrepresented groups working in s and fields, for example, is well below their share of the college edu educated workforce and national demographics. To put it bluntly, we need a more di uh, diverse STEM workforce. So how do we do that? Well, we need to provide opportunities for all students who want to engage in research to do so. We need to meet these students where they currently are located. So where are they? Well, more than two thirds of students from underrepresented minority groups in STEM fields and two thirds of Pell grantee recipients are what we call, are located at what we call emerging research institutions, uh, ERIs, which includes a smaller, which includes smaller state and regional schools and the majority of minority serving institutes. But the combined funding, uh, federal funding in science and engineering R&D for ERIs adds up to less than 10% of the federal, federal investment. This means that students at ERIs are being excluded from the future workforce by having limited or no opportunities to engage in research. This needs to change. We need to make investments necessary to build research capacities at these ERIs. And so this is an overlooked opportunity. Of course, we cannot rob Peter to pay Paul. So it's essential that we grow our overall investment in S and &E R&D. But as we do, we must rise to the challenge of addressing systemic inequalities in our current system and deliberately build our research capacity in a way that serves our entire community. So it's a complicated landscape, but you know, that old statement about being able to walk and chew gum at the same time, I'm sure we can figure this out, folks. I appreciate that, Jim. Um, you know, as we, uh, as we come to the end of our time here, we talked a little bit about some and those policy antidotes, but I'd love for us to, to come back and hit home. What are some of the actions that we'd love to see uh, in, terms of, in terms of Congress? You know, Dario and I, uh, are both uh, members of a group called the Science and Technology Action Committee. 
where we've at the biggest picture level said, you know, we need to we need to elevate science. We need to have the science advisor in the cabinet and see that. Thank goodness. Uh, we need to see coordinated activities uh, to address some of these big challenges uh, that is uh, that is led out of um, uh, that is led out of the White House to have OSTP. And then third, uh, really significant investments. And when we talk about those investments, we talk about you know, really uh, getting back at least to the levels that Matt was talking about. But in prescribing those dollar amounts, we see a whole bunch of activities that Congress has already put in front of us, the Endless Frontiers Act, the RISE Act. I'd love to hear from, uh, from some of you about, uh, about those pieces of legislation and what you see as opportunities and, and the urgency of uh, seeing those come into, come into law. Uh, Daria, you were shaking your head. Maybe you can go first. Yeah, I, I, I think this is why all the stars are aligning, right? The need, the opportunity, the urgency, and now the specific forms of legislation that have been you know, introduced or about to be reintroduced. I mean, the CHIPS Act, John was talking about it, existentially important to be able to do, right? We need semiconductors underpin, uh, you know, a lot of the technological base of the nation that needs to happen. The Endless Frontiers Act that would inject $100 billion into the National Science Foundation to expand its mission uh, of not only discovery-based science, but its translation mission. It's to, is the basis to be able to create, you know, new job opportunities, new industries, new security for the nation. And I saw like, you know, in the context of, for example, the quantum network infrastructure app uh, that was referenced in the chat, you know, how important that is. And we've seen, for example, in, in China, the context of like $10 billion worth of investment, right? In just quantum alone, we need to be able to increase those levels of investments following the National Quantum Initiative Act. So, so what, that's back to the point about action is the legislation is there. The moment is now. So, so what we all need to rally behind is this moment for action. And the nation is ready to execute this and to deliver. And it's going to have huge dividends for all of us and for present on our future. So it's time, time to get them passed. <laughs> Sorry, I, 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 love the, I love the fact you, should, you point out this, this convergence of different, uh, different uh, threads uh, is really remarkable. Barbara, are you, uh, do, you, what, what, do you see that, uh, that same convergence? And, and what more? I do, and it gives me hope. Uh, the, you mentioned the RISE Act, the research investment to spark the economy. And I want to note the connection between these investments and economic growth. So they, these, these research breakthroughs not only improve quality of life, but they also have dramatically positive effects on the economy. And I think that's so important. And there are a number of bills in, in that, that have been or will be introduced. Endless Frontier is a great one. I couldn't agree more about the importance. Um, the NSF has been underfunded for many years, too many years actually. And it's important to, to deal with that soon. Uh, investment in research infrastructure, I can't emphasize that enough because that is the, is the framework on which we build when we talk about this. Uh, the America Leads Act, Securing American Leadership in Science and Technology Act. There are so many pieces of good legislation. So I'm optimistic that this is a moment of convergence and these investments <clears throat> Search in the in the scientific um, workforce and in infrastructure will all come together right now for the benefit of of our country and actually the world. Perfect. Thank you, Barbara. Uh, Jim, then I'll turn to John for the last word. But, uh, Jim, thank, go ahead. yeah, thank you, uh, Sudi. Um, you know, in looking at the situation, I think visually about many many problems. And what this looks like to me is a is sort of a story which I have told some friends recently. It looks like, uh, think about perhaps Urson Bolt, the world's fastest human. He's in the starting blocks. The starter's pistol has just gone off. What does he do? Well, Urson actually has bad, bad uh, uh, starts out of the blocks, but he races to victory because he makes the investment on the field, on the track, as he's engaged with the competition. This is precisely what we as a country need to have as a model for how we're going to deal with this current challenge. And specifically, that means that we have to return to thinking about smart investments in the National Science Foundation, the Department of Energy, Office of Science, the National Institutes of Standards and Technology, the Department of Defense Basics Research Portfolio, and NASA through annual appropriation processes. So let's get our second win and win this race. 
I love that visual, Jim. Uh, and you know, other countries have, have taken off. They have gotten a quick start. Uh, and I love that you mentioned uh, appropriations. Uh, we can't forget the regular appropriations process. The 302A allocations and the 302B allocations are going to be critical to hitting these numbers. Uh, John, let me turn to you. Yeah. So the the planets are aligned. Uh, we need to strike while it, while the iron's hot. Um, so this is, you know, this is this is a big this is a big price tag. These are big numbers we're talking about. But I'll say others are embracing this around the world and, and, and making significant investments. We need, we need to step up. And, and my final, final comment is um, the price tag is big, but the cost of inaction is even bigger. Thank you, John. Um, uh, thank you, panelists, for an absolutely fabulous discussion. Uh, you know, we have an opportunity to, uh, to retrench, to build on the foundations that were laid 75 years ago and build our own moment in history uh, to, to really make the sciences go forward and to make sure that Americans are uh, get, reaping the benefits in, in terms of health and jobs. Uh, I'm going to turn now uh, uh, to Taffy to, to close us out and to uh, uh, take us out on the, uh, the note from the task force. Thank you, Taffy. Well, I'd like to thank very much our expert panelists. Um, the Task Force on Innovation has been supporting federally funded research for nearly 15 years now. It's clear we are at the start of a very important global race. We cannot afford to lose this race. We really must win. The urgency of science, the acceleration of science, <laughs> It's critical. I think that came through loud and clear in the conversation today. And so to echo what Sudip said, not only must we do the 301 or 302A allocations, we have to then move the money into the various committees, and then we have to ask the committees to fund science for the good of us all, for economic growth, for jobs, for national security, for leadership. Thank you so much to our panelists, and thank you very much to all of our participants. Hope to see you again. I mean, actually see you in person again sometime soon. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.